Welcome to the Unitarian Church in Fall River, where we think religious questions are important, but we want to work out our own answers and where we gather to share ideas and support one another. gather this hour as people of faith, having sorrows and joys and needs and gifts. We light this beacon of hope as a sign of our quest for truth and meaning and in celebration of the life we share together. Continuing on our series of hymns by our former minister, Samuel Longfellow, uh, can we please join in our opening hymn number 25, God of the Earth, the Sky, the Sea. Thank you. 
announcement. If you, if you uh, have only started attending recently and we don't have your email address, please give it to us on the, on the guest book just inside the front door. We promise we won't behave like CVS and, and, and send you an email every day for the rest of your life. Are there announcements? Al, I think you have one. Oh. Thank you. 
People couldn't hear. Was the microphone turned on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to let everyone know that. Slower. Slower. We'll be here. Thank you for being here. I'm not I'm not loud enough either. I'll try to Okay. My invocation this morning is from uh, Walt Whitman's long poem Song of Myself and this part of it I imagine him composing while walking down the street kicking leaves. Why should I wish to see God better than I do today? I see something of God each hour of the 24, and each moment then, in the faces of men and women, I see God, and in my own face in the glass, I find letters from, from God dropped in the street, and everyone is signed by God's name, and I leave them where they are, for I know that wheresoever I go, others will punctually come forever and ever. I wrote a prayer addressed to Walt Whitman's God. God, when life presents me with a major decision, should I let this new person into my life? Should I quit this job? Should I risk the operation? Should I put my brother into a nursing home? And so on. When life presents me with a major decision, how come I never have enough information? The very fact that I have a life poses questions. How should I spend my life? What will happen to me when my life is over? I imagine sometimes that at the end of my life, when I close my eyes for the last time, I'll hear an announcer saying, this has been a test. <laughs> it has only been a test. Had this been your actual life, you would have received more complete instructions. God, how come when I ask you questions, you never answer? That's the way I used to feel. Lately, I've started to feel that it's not that you don't answer, but that I don't notice your answer. One reason I don't notice your answer seems to be that you are always answering. Your answering is like the motion of the earth, which has been with me all, I, all my life in which I don't notice. Or your answer is like the air that surrounds me, of which I'm usually unconscious. And another reason I don't notice your answer seems to be that you don't answer in sentences and propositions, but in the subtleties of nature and of human interaction. When one of life's big questions is spinning around in my head, I can go to the woods or take a walk or sit on a bench for a while and I calm down. When the complexity of one of life's big questions overwhelms me, the voice or touch of another person can soothe me. And when the implications of one of life's big questions frighten me, I can open my heart to someone else and be comforted. God, I guess that the problem is not so much that you don't answer, 
but that I am only beginning to learn to listen carefully enough. Amen. And now let us be silent together to create an opportunity for prayer or meditation. Today is Palm Sunday on the Christian calendar. And here is the oldest of the accounts of the Palm Sunday event. Mark's gospel is the oldest of the gospels in the Bible. And I'm not gonna read from one to 11, just one through 10. Chapter 11, one through 10. When Jesus and his followers were approaching Jerusalem at Bethany near the Mount of Olives, so he's, they're approaching Jerusalem from the east. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, what are you doing? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Before going on, I want to talk a little bit about this reading while it's fresh in your mind. Biblical scholars tell us that Mark, the author, was not a Jew. He was living outside of Israel, and he was writing 40 years later, 40 years later. And he had heard that right at the end of Jesus's life, there had been this parade where he entered Jerusalem from the east. But Mark hadn't, didn't know the details. He just knew, knew that this has happened. And so he, he sought out the details and he sought them out by looking in the Bible. 
the Jewish Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, according to Jews. He looked in the Bible for details of this event, and he did it. He, he wasn't faking or writing fiction. He was a Christian, and, and he was convinced, as many Christians at the time were, that Jesus had been foretold in the Bible. And so this was a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And so one of the places he went was to the prophet Zechariah, where he found a passage that seemed to give information about this kind of parade. The verse in Zechariah, this is right toward the end of the Jewish Bible. This is chapter nine, verse nine. Rejoice greatly, O Zion, Shout aloud, O Jerusalem, lo, your king comes to you, triumph, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then searching through the scriptures, Mark found this passage in the 118th Psalm. Hosanna, O Lord, Hosanna, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches. So from Zechariah, he got the colt. From the psalm, he got Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and, the, and the procession with the branches, the palms. It, it, it's important not to think that, that that Mark was doing something fraudulent here. He had, he had faith that you could get information about Jesus in the Bible. And, and scholars, at least the scholars that I respect and, and, and read, uh, feel that this is where this passage came from. There, there was some kind of parade, but the details Mark had found from the Jewish Bible. The fact that this was passed down to Mark um, indicates that there was something important about this parade. So what actually happened or what was it really about? There was a, a scholar named George Caird, C-A-I-R-D, from Oxford University, who in the 60s said, you know, this smells like a political demonstration. It smells like a planned political demonstration. I need to interrupt myself for a moment and talk a little bit about the basic uh, political situation around Jesus's ministry. And if, if you've heard me speak about Jesus, you've heard me say this before, and, and I apologize, but I, I think it's important um, that I 
that I repeat this. Uh, when the Roman Empire took over Israel a few decades before Jesus was born, they had different policies than previous empires that had controlled Israel. And uh, as a result, the level of taxation went up. And this really affected the peasants. Jesus's followers were mostly peasants, that is subsistence farmers, and displaced peasants, meaning subsistence farmers who had lost their land. When the taxation went up, a lot of peasants found they couldn't pay. And so they mortgaged their land, which was all they had. And in many cases, they still couldn't pay and the mortgage was foreclosed on. And little peasant uh, farms were assembled in big estates that wound up in the hands of people friendly with the Roman rulers. And, the Ro and of course, there were, the peasants were upset about this. There were peasant uprisings regularly. The Romans put them down though fiercely. The Romans ruled by terror, by terrorizing the population. That's what crucifixion was about. It was a deliberately cruel way of executing someone in order to frighten everyone else into compliance. And here comes Jesus talking about God's empire and the contrast between God's empire and the Roman empire was clear to his followers. Um, now, you may not be familiar with the phrase God's empire, you're familiar probably with the phrase, the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus talked about. Um, that, I think that's really not a great translation. It, it, was, it was translated, of course, by people in England, which is a kingdom. So they said kingdom of God. But the Greek word, vasalia, uh, can be translated empire just as well. And Jesus lived in the Roman Empire. I think he said the empire of God, or rather more smoothly, God's empire. He's talking about God's empire. He meant, um, he, he, he was preaching this, that uh, there's an alternative to the Roman Empire, which is ruled by Roman law. God's empire was a vision Jesus had of how things could be if the place were governed by God's law instead of Roman law. And by God's law, he meant traditional Jewish ethics. I think what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God or God's empire is, is best summarized in a single verse from the prophet Micah, which you've heard me say over and over, or some of you have. Um, this is Micah chapter four, verse four. This is a, a prophecy about, about the good days ahead. And the prophet says, and they shall all it sit. These are the people, the Jewish people. They shall all sit under their own vines and their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. They shall all sit under their own vines and their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. It's a vision of peasants resting in the shade at the end of a long day, and they're sitting under their own vines and their own fig trees, so they have their land and no one shall make them afraid. So the government is not terrorizing them to keep order. That's, I think, what Jesus, Jesus' kingdom of God meant on his lips. It was a vision he had of how things could be. The key to unlocking the secret of the Palm Sunday parade uh, is usual when scholars can uncover something that everybody back there knew about. But because everybody knew about it, nobody mentioned it. Uh, and, and what everybody knew about was that at Passover time, every year, there was a parade that entered Jerusalem from the West. Every year, it happened. No need to mention it, right? Uh, Pontius Pilate, the governor, of Judea, of that part of Israel, the Roman governor, who represented the emperor. The emperor, by the way, was the son of God. That was the, one of the principal titles of the emperor. If you asked anyone back then, 
um, who's the son of God? They would have said, well, the emperor. That was the title of the emperor. The emperor was also called the savior. And, and the good news about the behavior was called the gospel of the emperor. These, these terms were later applied to Jesus, but originally they were political terms. Pontius Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. He lived on the Mediterranean coast, about 35 miles to the west. But every Passover, when people from all over Israel gathered in Jerusalem to commemorate their release from captivity by the Egyptian empire centuries before, there was always a certain amount of unrest because so many people felt like they were slaves to the Roman empire. They weren't literally most of them, but it, they felt that way. So there was a lot of political unrest. And so Pilate would make sure he was always in Jerusalem every Passover and he would bring soldiers to reinforce the garrison to help put down any unrest. And this was a two day parade from the Mediterranean Pilate is up there on, on horseback, dressed lavishly with an entourage, mostly walking and soldiers walking. Um, and when they arrived at the West Gate of Jerusalem, uh, there was basically a red carpet. Carpets were put on the road. People probably did throw their cloaks on the road. I don't know about branches, but it was a big deal. And it happened every year. And I'd like to suggest that um, that Jesus parade was a deliberate imitation of that. It was a mockery of that. Uh, when the people were, were, were uh, saluting Jesus as if he were the governor, that is, if he were the emperor, because the governor represents the emperor, the, 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 there was a political message. And the message was, it isn't the emperor who knows how the place should be run. It's Jesus who knows how the place to be run. It should be run according to God's law instead of Roman law. That is basic Jewish ethics. It's not the emperor who deserves or the emperor's representative who deserves this kind of adulation, but Jesus representing God's empire. I think it was a deliberate mockery and, and no doubt added to the, the hot water that Jesus was in real soon after that. I think Easter week, this is what we should remember, not that Jesus died or that people started telling stories about him coming back from the dead, but, but the reason he was, he was seen as a threat to the empire in the first place, he was proclaiming God's empire instead of the Roman empire. And now for the support of this congregation and its work, the morning offering will be gratefully received and I hope freely given.
time for sharing joys and concerns. The, the mathematical theory is that a joy shared is multiplied and a concern shared is divided. Alan. Uh, I just want to share joy, which uh, saw two feeds um, in the back of our house. They open every year to build a nest on top of the front door of the electrical commission uh, in the back of our house. And uh, uh, so they're back. And I, I got a feed again. First week in April, but I do not. The feeds are back. <laughs> So I have some good news and some bad news. I started with the bad news first. You may have heard that the swans, and the swans here by so far, I think they've caught five, now five of the bodies. Uh, it's a mystery as to what they're dying from the different babies. There was a large population of swans all winter. We were going to have to go to swan library. Uh, it was such a mild winter, they grouped together, and sometimes there was a little bay there. You could see 30 or 40 swans up there. So, swans, he was absolutely named. That's the bad news. The state of uh, Massachusetts sent uh, biologists to examine the birds and find out if they could come up with a diagnosis. The, the good news is, and this is really quite exciting to me, uh, being a nature observer picture, if my wife saw a daughter behind our house, and it's a brackish water, a cold river, you know, but I've never seen an otter. It's close to civilization. And it, it, it was fishing. It pulled its little head up, and she didn't get the camera on fast enough. But it, it was really a, a blessed experience to, to see a mother locally. Uh, I suspect he came down the Coles River from someplace up north uh, or out to the west. And uh, Maybe he was young and adventurous. <laughs> I don't know, but he had seen quite a bit and uh, able to fish. But of course, we have a lot of uh, mohawks behind our house. So he was probably uh, delighted with the feast. Well, I guess he had to sing his song. Join in our closing hymn, number 121, We'll Build a Land.
that like sunshine goes everywhere its temple all space its shrine the good heart its creed all truth its ritual works of love amen mm -hmm. 